This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show looking at the tragic death of Tony Timpa. In August of 2016, the 32-year-old Dallas, Texas man called 911 for help. During the call, Timpa said he was scared and told the dispatcher he suffered from schizophrenia and depression, but was off his medication for schizophrenia. The police responded, and within 20 minutes, Tony Timpa was dead. For the past three years, the city of Dallas has fought efforts to release police body cam footage showing what happened. But the video was finally released this week after a prolonged legal battle. The shocking video contains disturbing footage. When officers arrived on the scene, they found Timpa was already handcuffed by a private security guard. In the video, Timpa repeatedly pleaded for his life. Help me! Tony! Hey, get on the ground. No, you're gonna kill me. I'm not gonna kill you. You're gonna kill me. You're gonna kill me. The body cam video shows officers pinning Timpa face first into the ground, with one of them jamming a knee into Timpa's back and pressing down hard. The officers swap handcuffs and zip tie Timpa's feet together, as well as re handcuff him. Timpa's heard pleading, Will you let me go, please? After Tony Timpa became unresponsive, the officers stood over his unmoving body mocking him as though he had fallen asleep. First day, you can't be late. Tony. We bought your new shoes for the first day of school. Come on. <laughs> made breakfast, scrambled eggs, your favorite. What, waffles? Waffles. Fruity, tooty, fruity waffles. I think he's out cold now. Yeah, he's, he's probably waking up. Mm -hmm. I don't know, he just got quiet. All of a sudden, he just whoop. The dark here? Oh, there he comes. Sound like he was snoring. The Dallas police officers keep Tony Tempa restrained on the ground. They don't check to see if he is breathing or even has a pulse. The video then shows police taking Tony Tempa to an ambulance where a paramedic declares Tempa dead. The video directly contradicts claims ma made by the pa Dallas Police Department defending the officer's behavior. We go now to Dallas, where we're joined by Jeff Henley, lawyer representing the Tempa family. Thank you so much for joining us before your national news conference that you're holding today, Jeff. Can you explain what this video, how you got a hold of this video? Again, this happened three years ago, and what exactly it shows. Good morning, Amy. Thank you for having me. Well, this story began uh, three years ago, as you're indicating, and we actually our law firm had sought um, public information requests, and they were declined. And we eventually filed um, a writ of mandamus because the city had violated the Freedom of Information Act statutes here in Texas. Um, ultimately, they did produce um, the video to us, uh, but it was predicated on a confidentiality order uh, and contemporaneous with that, we had actually filed our federal uh, civil rights lawsuit on behalf of the family as we began to unearth more details. Uh, the video itself um, has been under wraps since, well, as you've indicated, this week. Um, and it was released uh, solely because the criminal actions against the three uh, officers, Dillard, Vasquez, and Sergeant Mansell, uh, were dismissed uh, a few months ago by the district attorney here. Um, and there being no uh, pending criminal action, uh, Judge David Godby determined there's no basis to keep this uh, matter of a secret anymore. Indeed, he found quite the contrary and said that there's a 
compelling public purpose for the people to ascertain what happened between one man and law enforcement. As you've indicated, the video itself is horrific. Uh, for some 14 minutes, Dustin uh, Dillard has his knee lodged uh, directly in uh, Tony's back. Tony's face is mashed into the ground. Uh, his words become increasingly garbled as he's unable to breathe. And as his blood uh, begins to become more acidotic, uh, his heart begins to race. And as you indicated in your broadcast uh, earlier, one of the things that has absolutely uh, troubled me the most is that Tony Tempa was handcuffed by private security guards before the Dallas police officers arrived there. He thus, there was no need to switch the handcuffs uh, that they employed. And what, why was that significant? Well, number one, the, the idea that they would remove his handcuffs in the first place tells you something extremely important under federal civil rights law, and that is he was not a threat. But number two, in this particular instance, it prolonged the period of restraint and the period of time when he would have his diaphragm compressed, his lungs smothered, and his face mushed into the ground. These were critical moments that resulted in his death and, it, and were needlessly uh, prolonged by the officers. So he was handcuffed As, by security guards. The police came, took the handcuffs off, put their own handcuffs on, and shackled his feet? They zip-tied his uh, feet uh, with uh, plastic zip-ties. Um, but yes, the video, uh, the body cam footage from two of the officers uh, well, at least one of the officers depicts uh, the, the, the handcuffs being switched, and you can hear them commenting on, you know, the difficulty they're having switching the handcuffs. But again, uh, there was no need uh, to remove the handcuffs in the first place, and, and it's further evidence that Tony Tempa did not present a threat. And these three officers, in fact, they would ultimately be charged? What were they charged with? And why were these they, charges dropped? They were indicted. Uh, a, a Dallas County grand jury handed down uh, indictments for three of the officers uh, for the charge of reckless conduct or deadly conduct. It's a class A misdemeanor, carries a, a, um, a penalty of, of a maximum uh, of one year in the county jail uh, and up to a $4,000 fine. Uh, they were indicted by the Dallas County Grand Jury, and about a year and a half later, the district attorney dismissed the case. And what was so troubling uh, for the family, of course, is it created some significant expectations that they were going to get justice in the criminal courts. But compounding the problem is anytime you have a criminal prosecution, typically the defendants seek a stay of the parallel civil action that had been previously filed. You know, bear in mind, we had filed our own lawsuit um, on behalf of the family uh, back in 2016, and our case got stuck in a block of ice uh, during the pendency of the criminal action. So not only was the uh, body cam footage under wraps during that period of time, but our civil action was frozen. So I want to go back to that day, and again, Tony had called the police himself, saying he was struggling off of um, taking his medication. He asked them for help when they came. Um, were these officers— we then see not only do they— I mean, is it essentially hog-tying? They shackle again his hands and then his feet, and they restrain him, putting their knee into his back on the ground for 14 minutes. They then it, mock him? It's certainly the functional equivalent of a hog tie and probably more severe because of the knee in the back. Um, what the autopsy reveals is photographs of severe hemorrhaging in his upper, upper scapular region, a, a pretty significant pool of blood that pools uh, at the very top uh, in the area of where the knee was placed. Um, you know, again, you're You've got a, a, the weight of a, of a single officer who's probably between 160 and 180 pounds being driven into the back of this man while he's on the side of the road. 
Meanwhile, you have another officer on his left shoulder who's periodically pressing, uh, pressing him down, though not as consistently um, as Dillard was for in excess of 14 minutes. Then, as you've indicated, uh, his ankles were zip tied with nylon zips uh, and his legs were sometimes elevated. Uh, it would be a, virtually impossible for somebody who's, uh, you know, on cocaine uh, and in mental crisis to effectively breathe. Now, what is it they are saying to him as they mock him and laugh on top of him, saying, wake up? Well, so the ridicule actually even began before your, uh, your tape there. Uh, Sergeant Mansell is heard off camera kind of making cracks about Tony's uh, relative wealth. Uh, he, he purposely mispronounces Mercedes. Uh, they, he, he takes shots at um, Tony's uh, uh, ties or, or, or yacht club membership. It's, a, it's actually not so much of a yacht club. It's a, more of a boat club down here in Texas. We don't really have <laughs> yachts. Uh, but uh, that, that sort of begins uh, this sort of, you know, gallows humor. Uh, and then a few minutes later, when you're talking, um, they're 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 making this phony uh, or fallacious notion that he's asleep, and they they act as though, hey, he's uh, you're going to be late for school, Tony. It's it's your mom. Uh, let's wake up. We've got you some new shoes. We've got you some waffles and Rudy Tooty Fruity waffles. Um, and you know, he's while, dying now. I think he's, pro I mean, obviously I'm not a pathologist, but he's completely unresponsive. And despite the claims of snoring, you don't hear snoring. What you see is uh, with the closer footage is you see kind of reddish purple skin. Uh, and Tony, in the lead up to that lack of complete responsiveness, begins to become increasingly incoherent. It's like his tongue has swollen or he's just becoming more disoriented. And during that process, it, he's, it's kind of a garbled mumble. And then the officers take a shot at that um, and begin to mimic that sound where you hear that bloop, bloop, bloop noise or something to that effect. Um, and it's, it's despicable. Now, what is administered to him? Who is giving him a shot? So the uh, paramedics actually uh, administer belatedly Versed, which is a known sedative and, they, and, and is designed to lower a subject's heart rate uh, because one of the conditions that you're really trying to avoid from um, respiratory distress is the heart begins to race so fast, um, faster than the, than the lungs can really oxygenate, and the blood eventually becomes acidotic. And so what you're trying to do is slow everything down, um, because despite the fact that Tony's not moving, uh, inside his uh, heart is, you know, working like overdrive. It's like a, a, and, a car that's, you know, redlining. And if the police had come, and they'd come with the medics, and the medic had given him that shot at the very beginning. Would Tony Tempa be alive today? I'm not an expert in pathology, but I firmly believe that he would be. And these officers, who would ultimately be charged, but then those charges dropped, <clears throat> one of them served in Afghanistan. Did he go off to serve in Afghanistan, or did he serve before? We were told that he actually was deployed in Afghanistan. Um, Officer I, Dillard. I actually, yes, that's right. I um, actually raised that issue because the case had gotten stayed once uh, as a result of that deployment. There's an automatic stay when an officer uh, is deployed. And, uh, but I, it was represented to me by the city that he was deployed to Afghanistan. And, and of course we, you know, we want our uh, first responders, or we want, we certainly don't want to stand in the way of service to their country, but it, it, it was the first day. And then short, uh, almost uh, a couple of months right after he returned, the case got stayed again as a result of the, uh, criminal charges. Hmm. So the sequence was they killed, uh, Tony Tempa and then he went off to Afghanistan, then came back. Yes.
Um, what should officers do? Were these officers trained? Um, how do you deal with a mental health crisis, someone who, from the beginning, who made the call to 911, said, I am suffering from a mental health crisis? So this is a <clears throat> ongoing problem in law enforcement. I've represented other folks um, who've, and, and, and frankly, have lost cases uh, that have been thrown out uh, where deadly force was employed against somebody in a mental crisis. Uh, the judiciary, uh, for the last decade, has been struggling with this because everybody knows this just creates horrific situations. Um, and the bottom line is, um, cops are not the best medics, and they're not the—they're frequently not the best people to uh, talk people off of ledges uh, or or de-escalate situations. In this particular case, of course, uh, Tony Tempa should have been flipped back onto his back. Um, if you listen closely to the tape, the officers don't complain uh, that he was fighting aggressively with them. They use the term squirm uh, if he was squirming. And again, this is the same. And, and by the way, this is while somebody's on your back. Um, you know, it's quite natural and, and easy to be anticipate that if you've got a 160 to 180 pound man or more on your back, you're going to squirm. Um, and so putting, placing him on his back, giving him the verset, um, these are things that, you know, uh, and, or possibly even waiting him out a little bit. Uh, one of the things that the officers maintained at least a couple of years ago is they were saving his life by preventing him from rolling into uh, nearby Mockingbird Road or Mockingbird Lane. And the idea is that too, just the, the risk of that was, I wouldn't use the word remote, but certainly unlikely. So what are you calling for? What are you demanding in your lawsuit? Um, you'll be holding this news conference with Tony's mother, is that right? Right. Well, so we filed this lawsuit uh, some three, you know, virtually almost three years ago, um, more than two and a half years ago. And it is a classic 1983 uh, Fourth Amendment excessive law, uh, excessive force lawsuit. And we are seeking monetary damages uh, for uh, Tony's mother and Tony's son and for Tony's former wife. Uh, we are seeking a very significant sum of money because that is the only thing that gets uh, not just the family justice, but gets civil actors to change their conduct. Until, until they spend money on lawyers uh, and, and, and making claims um, and satisfying claims, they don't tend to spend money on the front end to prevent tragedies like this. Just like anything else, you have to make uh, you, you have to hit them in the pocketbook to make them change their conduct. Jeff Henley, we want to thank you very much for being with us. Dallas attorney with the law firm Henley & Henley. He is representing the Timpa family, and we'll continue to cover this, of course. This is Democracy Now! When we come back 54 years ago this week, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed off on Medicare and Medicaid. We'll look at this as a top issue in the presidential campaign right now. Medicare for all. How did it get passed then? What will happen today?